You're not even born yet, and you feel something scratching your egg. A tiny deep sea creature is crawling across the surface of your egg sac, its mandibles testing the membrane, looking for a weak spot. Inside, you're curled up, fully formed, ready to hatch. The creature finds a soft spot and starts biting through. The membrane tears. Salt water rushes in. You're ripped out of your egg three hours early, tumbling into the ocean with half your yolk sac still attached. The creature immediately lunges for the yolk, its pure protein, exactly what it was hunting for. You have two choices, stay and fight, or swim away and starve without your food supply. You swim. The creature doesn't follow. It's too busy eating the yolk that was supposed to keep you alive for the next week. You're on your own now, one hour old, and you just lost your only food source. And you're about to discover something that changes everything about you. You're starving. That yolk sac was supposed to feed you until you were strong enough to hunt, but it's gone. You open your mouth. You're filter feeding, eating the water itself. The first thing you catch is a copepod the size of a grain of sand. It's not enough. You need to catch thousands of these things to survive one day. You swim forward with your mouth open. Your stomach is filling, but barely. Then something changes the game. You taste blood in the water. The blood is coming from above. You swim toward it. When you reach the source, you freeze in shock. A dead jellyfish is floating on the surface. Its tentacles are scattered everywhere. Hundreds of creatures are swarming at fish larvae like you. Tiny shrimp, microscopic scavengers. You drift closer. Your gill rakers catch a chunk of jellyfish tissue the size of a pinhead. It's solid food, not microscopic dust. Your body processes it instantly, and for the first time in your life, you actually feel full. But you're not alone. Another larva bigger than you, darker colored swims straight at you with its mouth open. It's not filter feeding. It's trying to eat you. You dodge sideways. The other larva miss and crash into the jellyfish. While it's distracted, you grab another chunk of tissue and swim away as fast as your tiny fins can push you. For the next eight weeks, this is your life. You're growing, but slowly. You're two inches long now, and your body is still gray and transparent. But then your mouth starts hurting, and everything changes. When you try to filter feed, something sharp scratches the inside of your mouth. You can taste blood, your own blood. Something is growing inside your mouth. You try to filter feed, but you can't. You try to close your mouth, but the teeth hit the roof of your mouth. You're stuck with your mouth hanging open, unable to eat the way you've eaten your whole life. For three days, you don't eat anything. You're starving while your own body destroys the only way you know how to survive. Months pass, and you have barely eaten anything. Your body is eating itself to stay alive. You are sinking deeper. At 800 feet, you encounter a tiny lanternfish, barely an inch long, with glowing spots along its side. It's not filter feeding, it's hunting the same microscopic creatures you used to eat. You drift closer. Your eyes are dim now, but you can feel vibrations. Your sensors along your side detect the lanternfish's movements. You open your mouth. The lanternfish swims right between your jaws. You snap them shut. Your teeth impale it instantly. It thrashes violently, trying to escape. But your backward curved fangs make that impossible. But then you realize something's wrong. You can't breathe. Your mouth is full of fish, blocking the normal flow of water through your gills. Panic hits immediately. You're suffocating while holding your food. Your body does something automatic, something you didn't know you could do. Your gill covers blow open wide, exposing all your gills directly to the water. Then your fins start pumping like fans, pushing water backward over your gills from the wrong direction. You're breathing in reverse. It's awkward and it's the only thing keeping you alive while you try to swallow this fish. Finally, it slides into your stomach. You stop fanning. Your gills close. You can breathe normally again. You just ate for the first time in six days and you nearly died doing it. This is your life now, and it only gets worse. You're at 1,500 feet now. The pressure here is insane. Your swim bladder, that little balloon of air that helped you float, couldn't handle it. Now, you're denser than water. You don't float anymore, you sink unless you're actively swimming. And swimming burns energy. Energy you don't have because you haven't eaten in three weeks. A hatchet fish swims past, its belly glowing bright blue. The glow illuminates you for just a second. That's all it takes. Something big detects the movement and charges. You dive. You dive straight down into darker water, your fins pumping desperately. You can feel its pressure wave getting closer. You are sinking deeper. At 3,000 feet, the thing chasing you gives up and turns back. You stop swimming and just drift, your body screaming from the exertion. Your ribs feel like they're bending inward. But you're alive. You've dropped so deep that almost nothing lives down here. It's safer, but there's zero food. You'll have to go back up eventually. You always have to go back up. Because the food lives where the predators hunt, and there's no way around that. Skip forward four months, and you've learned the pattern. Every night, you migrate upward, 3,000 feet up to 800 feet toward the surface to feed. It takes you four hours to swim up, 
in four hours to swim back down before sunrise. Tonight, you're hunting at 900 feet when you sense something perfect. A small squid? You drift closer, your ultra-black skin making you invisible. The squid never sees you coming. Your fangs impale it through the middle. It explodes into action, spraying ink, its tentacles wrapping around your face. But your backward curved teeth have it locked. There's no escape. You start the reverse breathing process immediately. The squid is fighting inside your mouth, its beak trying to bite your tongue. You can't swallow it yet. You have to wait for it to stop moving. Five minutes pass. Ten minutes. Fifteen. You're burning energy you don't have. Your jaw is cramping. Your fins are exhausted. Then you feel something else. Vibrations in the water. Something big is approaching, attracted by the squid's distress signals. You can't see it, but you can feel it getting closer. And you can't run, your mouth is full, you're reverse breathing, and you're completely vulnerable. A tuna materializes out of the darkness, six feet long, its eye the size of your entire head. It's not here for the squid, it's here for you. The tuna charges. You force your jaws open, releasing the squid, and dive straight down. The squid shoots away in the opposite direction. The tuna has to choose chase the fast-moving squid or the slow-moving fangtooth. It chooses the squid. You watch your meal disappear into the tuna's mouth as you flee into the depths. This is the reality of having teeth so big you can't even eat properly. Every meal is a race against suffocation. Every hunt puts a target on your back. You can't grow new ones. If they break, they're gone forever. And they're about to break. You're hunting near 2,000 feet when you catch a lanternfish. Perfect size, perfect prey. Your fangs sink in. You start reverse breathing. Everything's going according to plan. Then the lanternfish does something unexpected. It bites back. Lanternfish chomps down on your right fang, right at the base, where the tooth meets your jaw. You feel a crack. A crack. A fracture line running up your fang from bottom to top. You swallow the lanternfish and see the damage. Your right fang is still attached, but it's compromised. One hard bite and it'll snap off completely. And you can't replace it. If that fang breaks, you'll spend the rest of your existence hunting with only one good tooth. For the next six months, you baby that cracked fang. You avoid hard pre. You aim for soft targets only. Squid, small fish, jellyfish scraps. Then you get desperate. You haven't eaten in a month. Your body is eating its own muscles. When you find a small hatchet fish with a bony skull, you don't think about the cracked fang. You just bite down. The fang snaps. You feel it break off at the fracture line, the top half of your tooth tumbling down your throat along with the hatchet fish. When you close your mouth, only the stump remains a broken tooth that'll never grow back. But you're still alive. You adapt. You learn to angle your strikes to favor your good side. You become more selective about prey. You survive, barely, for another four years. Until the night your luck finally runs out. You're five years old, scarred from a dozen close calls. Your right fang is broken. Your left worn and bent. You haven't eaten in six weeks. Tonight, you're at only 300 feet too shallow because you're too weak to swim deeper. A small fish drifts nearby, lit by a jellyfish's glow. Easy prey. You need this. You drift closer. Ultra black and invisible. Ten feet away. Five feet. Three feet. The water explodes. A marlin's bill slams through your side, cracks four ribs, and exits your back. You're sinking into the final depth. And believe it or not, there's an animal with an even worse life. Watch that story next.